we're going to be looking at, over the next couple of, next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the wounds, uh, what they look like, uh, how they affect us, where we find healing, how we receive that healing, and what we do once we begin the process of healing. And I think just to, to, to start us off, it's so critical that we start off by looking to the place of healing, or better yet, the person of healing. I think a lot of times we have heard so much about Christ being the physician, Christ being the healer of our souls. He is the healer we find throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament, the Gospels. We find so many miracles of Jesus healing so many people. And a lot of times we walk in and we're looking around and, and, and we just don't see him. And the reality is he's right there hidden in plain view. He's hidden in plain view. He's right there in front of us for, for us to see Anyone ever lost their keys before? Everyone ever? Okay. Well, I have this gadget, my little Bluetooth earpiece. I lose this thing at least twice a day. Okay? And it's always, and I'm like searching high and low, and I'm looking under couch cushions, and underneath the couch, and in the refrigerator, and in the freezer, and look at everyone. And it's usually sitting right there on the side of the couch, right where I put it. Right there. And a lot of times we look right past and we don't actually see the healer and the source of healing right in front of us. The truth of the matter, and this is a passage we're going to come back to time and time again these next few weeks. In Matthew 9 verse 35, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. This is what Jesus did. He walked around and just healed people. He had compassion on people and was just healing. Every different type of disease and, and sickness you can imagine, he was healing them. And his healing ministry continues today. But one thing we have to understand is how it is that our wounds have affected us. And what exactly our wounds are, so that we can know what it is that we need to bring to Christ. The principle for this series is going to be this. Wounds, your wounds, will shape your experience your identity, and ultimately, hopefully, your ministry, your service to God. Okay? Your wounds are so critical. A lot of times we ignore those, but your wounds are so important because they themselves will define your experience of God, of life, of yourself, of others, your identity, and ultimately how you come to serve and how you come to minister. Now, those wounds will shape your experience, your identity, your, your ministry, either if they are healed or unhealed. But they'll just shape your experience, your identity, and your ministry in a very, very, very different way. When God creates humans in the very beginning, He creates them to live in peace with them, in shalom, in harmony. Okay? He created them to be in harmony with Him, with each other, and within themselves. But the reality is today many people are in a state of brokenness. They're in a state of woundedness. And Isaiah chapter 1 verse 5 to 7 says, The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness in it. He says you got wounds everywhere you can imagine. And we have wounds in our bodies, in our hearts, in our minds, wounded all over the place. There is complete brokenness. And ultimately this relationship of shalom, this relationship of harmony that we were created to have with God and with others and with ourselves, ends up becoming a relationship of alienation. A relationship of no longer being in harmony, no longer having shalom with God and, and with others, and, and certainly even feeling alienated with ourselves. We can feel like a fish out of water at times. When God creates humans, He says, the best thing I'm going to give you is to live in community. But after the fall, there's alienation from God to start with. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, so he, so he said, he being Adam, says to God, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. The voice of God that used to be the voice of peace to him, the voice of healing, the voice of life, becomes the voice of fear. Nothing in God changes. God is still pursuing humans with love and and, and being who he is, which is love. But something in Adam and Eve changes 
they become wounded, and now they hear the voice of God differently. They became afraid. I, they hid from God. Colossians chapter 1 tells us, in verse 21, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. The alienation with God happens here. We say we're not good enough for God. God no longer loves us. We can't come before God. But the alienation happens in our minds because of wickedness. Never forget years ago, my brother and I, this was during Hurricane Alicia back in the 80s when we lived in Houston. And we were bored out of our minds. We were told by our parents, like, you got to stay inside the house. We couldn't. We got cabin fever. We had to get out. We stuck inside for like four or five days. We're like, we got to get out. So we decided to do what any normal elementary age kid, seven and ten year old kids would do. We decided to climb up on the roof and go jumping off into the big pool of water that had been created from the hurricane. All right? And so we're having the best time of our lives. We're running and jumping and sliding into the backyard. And it's like... Thank God we didn't break anything, okay? But, like, we had a blast. And we went about our merry day, got all cleaned up, mom and dad come home. Water starts coming down a little bit in the back, up front, everything. And so we said, we want to go out and play. So my brother and I, we go to ride our bikes. On our way back, we see our next-door neighbor standing with our dad. And we, so we live in a coal sack. And so we're coming down, and my brother, poor sucker, didn't see the, the neighbor. And he rides right up into the lion's den. And to you, you get over here! And I just whoosh, took off. <laughs> and when I came home that night, I kind of left my bike outside, went inside the house, got changed real quick, hid under the covers, and pretended like I was asleep. Okay. hiding from the one who loves me. When we sin, this is exactly what happens. When we've been wounded, even if it's not self-inflicted, if someone else has wounded us, it can make us feel we don't belong to that one that loves us. And we become terrified. And we hide. And we run. In Matthew chapter 9, there's a story of a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. And this flow of blood is uncontrollable. This flow of blood, it was something inside of her. It was not something that she chose to do. This wasn't a sin that she chose. This was something that was in her, in her nature, in her being. Okay? This was a sickness. And... Back. And... This woman, as a result of this sickness, this disease, she becomes alienated from God. In Jewish custom, in Jewish law, a woman who has had a flow of blood like that for 12 years, she couldn't enter the temple. She couldn't enter the synagogue. She was ritually unclean. No choosing of hers. Something that had happened to her. Something that had, if you will, been done to her. Something that she didn't pick. And so it's so important that we realize that alienation from God is not always because of something that we have chosen. Sometimes there are wounds that are inflicted upon us that causes us to have this division, this separation from God. Sometimes it's an addiction. Sometimes it's something that we just have got to a point that we are in bondage to the sin. Something, someone did something, I'll share a little bit next week more on this, but someone has done something to us that has abused us, for instance, and as a result, we think, like, this is the right way of living. This is the right thing to do, is to abuse the next person. Okay? As a result, sometimes of being wounded, we feel alien from God. Okay? Oftentimes, those things are things that we choose. But sometimes... They're not. Sometimes it's a result of something else, either in nature or something that someone has done to us that has caused us to experience these wounds and alienation from God. 
In addition to being alienated from God in Genesis 4, we find that Cain and Abel, humans, become alienated from each other. And he, God, says to Cain, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The very first thing that happens after the fall, very first story, two brothers kill each other. Right afterwards, what happens? You got the next story, you got a flood. Because the wickedness on earth is like, like no other time. The people become alienated from each other. And the climax of that alienation is after the Tower of Babel is built, they become completely alienated, they become divided from each other. Okay? Probably the worst, most painful example of this kind of alienation happens in 2 Samuel chapter 13 and 14. Now, in this story, it happens in King David's family. Okay? King David has a son named Amnon who violently rapes his beautiful half-sister Tamar. Okay? And her brother, Absalom, has his half-brother murdered. His whole focus becomes revenge. And when his sister, when Amnon's sister comes to him after Absalom's been killed, very, very compassionately, he says to her, sarcasm, insert sarcasm, he says, ah, it's not a big deal, don't take this thing to heart. It's a big deal. Even when he's trying to do something to help his sister, his focus is not, to be, is not reconciliation. It only leads to more alienation. And ultimately, after Tamar dies, she becomes a desolate woman, she's forgotten, and then he ends up leading, naming his own daughter, Tamar. Which tells you what? Oftentimes, sin compounds into sin. And alienation from God compounds into alienation from others. Third and finally, is we become alienated from ourselves. Alienated from ourselves. The passage we looked at earlier in Genesis 3 where Adam says to God, I heard the sound of, your, of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, I hid myself. This idea of fear means literally to be torn apart inside, to be divided within myself. Okay? Fear and anxiety we literally feel where our heart is coming outside of us, our heart feels split, there's a division going on inside of our members within us. And what 1 John 4.18 tells us is that perfect love casts out fear. This is not a spirit of God. When we become alienated from Him and from others and from ourselves, this is not a God thing. We were created to live in harmony and to live in peace with God, to have shalom with God, to have shalom with others, to have shalom with ourselves. But this inner division, this inner alienation from within ourselves can manifest itself psychologically, emotionally, relationally, physically. People can get sick because of fear, have psychosomatic symptoms, unable to deal with other people, it compounds more and more and more. Okay? Our wounds, if left undealt with, our sins, if left undealt with, this disease can impact us and make us more and more sick. If you think about a person who has a gunshot wound, if you leave the bullet inside, they're going to get infected. You're going to have to cut off one of their arms, get rid of it, right? You've got to get it out, clean it up, bandage it up. You've got to deal with the wounds. Okay? Sin is a disease that has to be dealt with. Wounds, as a result of the sin, have to be dealt with. This sin ultimately causes a division between heaven and earth, between us and God. And it leads to a complete brokenness within our lives. So ultimately what happens is you have sin. If sin is this disease, it leads to alienation from God, which ultimately leads to brokenness okay, and woundedness. Our principle for today is the, is the following. Is it? Your greatest need, your greatest need is to receive healing from the disease of sin through Jesus Christ. Our greatest need is not to come to church and be part of the community. That's a, that's a great added benefit. And healing happens within the community, certainly. Okay? 
our greatest need is not to come and find our place and like get a leadership role and minister. That'll come as a byproduct. Our greatest need is not to get a great job and get married and have kids. Our greatest need is to receive healing from this disease and the wound woundedness of this disease from Jesus Christ, who is himself the great physician. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, he lived back in the 4th century, Bishop of Jerusalem. He wrote 22 catechetical letters. We're going to be going through some of these in discovery starting next week. But in his 10th letter, he says the following. It says, Jesus then means according to the Hebrew, Savior, but in the Greek tongue, the healer, since he is the physician of our souls and bodies, cure of spirits, curing the blind in body, leading minds into light, healing the visible, visibly laid, guiding sinners' steps to repentance, saying to the palsied sin no more, take up thy bed and walk. Jesus is the physician. He is the healer. If we're looking for healing, the only place we're going to really find healing is from Christ alone. The spiritual wounds, the spiritual hurt that we have, we're not going to find it elsewhere. You can go through 12-step programs all you want. It's good stuff. I'm not, no problem with 12-step programs. But the healing happens by the grace of God, by Christ himself, his spirit working inside of us. I just want to give you five quick points, and then we'll wrap up with some questions, all right? First, we have to remember that the power of the Lord is present to heal. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, it says, Then he got into a boat, Jesus, got into a boat, crossed over, came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to him, the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And then there's like this debate back and forth between the people, and how can you say Take, your sins are forgiven you, and he heals the man. In the Luke account, it says something very different. There's another part that St. Luke says that St. Mark doesn't say. In verse 17, it says, And the power of the Lord was present to heal. The power of the Lord was present to heal. And I want to show you that the power of the Lord is present to heal today. The power of the Lord didn't stop working 2,000 years ago when Jesus went up to heaven. Okay? The power of the Lord continues to be present in His body, the church, His grace, His spirit working. The power of the Lord is present to you. That's the reason why we refer to the church as a hospital. Hospital is a place you go to get healed. And the physician himself is present in order to heal and when I say the church, I'm not reducing the church to what we do Sunday mornings. The church is the body. And so the church, the body of Christ, needs to be a place of healing. Okay? Which means the people of Christ need to share in the ministry of healing. And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. All right? The source of healing and where it all begins, Isaiah 53 verse 5 says... He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. By his stripes we're healed. The place of healing is in his broken body, his wounded body. When we break the Eucharist, we're saying, by your brokenness, we receive healing. We unite ourselves to the broken Christ himself who offers himself to us, who himself is present in order to heal us. Gregory of Nyssa, in his great catechism, Gregory of Nyssa is the younger brother of St. Basil. He says, a patient to be healed must be touched. Must be touched. Okay? You're not going to heal a person without touching them, if you're a doctor. And humanity had to be touched by Christ. It, being the human nature, was not in heaven, so only through the incarnation could it be healed. Christ, the physician, comes to us, touches our humanity, unites himself to us, so that we can be healed. And his presence is continued to be experienced in his body, which is the church today. This is in a general sense. But very importantly, it's got to be personal. Number two, the power of the Lord is present to heal, yes. But I want to invite you to make it personal. Make it personal. Never forget, a few years ago I was talking to someone, and 
I'm like 45 minutes, she's talking to me about her brokenness, her woundedness, she's like suffering, and she was abused as a child, and, and her father beat her and forced into me, all this kind of like mess of stuff is going on. And I'm like talking to her about the healing work of Christ and how God can work in her lives and in her life and he can, he can restore her and restore her marriage and restore her family and all this stuff. And at the very end she says to me, man, I wish my children were here to hear this. I'm like, young hot, it's sweet. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, no, this is not for your kids, it's for you. Come on. Make it personal. We're always saying about, man, I wish that so-and-so was here. I wish that bomb that upset me last week was in church today so we could hear what I, what, what's being said. They need you. No, no, no. Make it personal. Make it personal. It's not about the guy who's not in here today. Not about the people that are on the streets. Make it personal. This isn't about your kids. This isn't about your spouse. This isn't about your parents. This isn't about your Sunday school teacher. This isn't about your priest. This isn't about, well, maybe it is about your priest, okay? <laughs> but make it personal. Make it personal. Jesus came in order to heal you. It's for that reason why... In verse 10 of Matthew 9, he says, Now it happened as Jesus sat table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. The Pharisees saw it. They said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He says, I'm going to come sit with the worst of the worst of the worst and offer appeal. So I'm saying make it personal. You think you're the worst of the worst? That's what Jesus came for. Jesus didn't come for the healthy people. He said the healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people are the ones who need a doctor. And so he went and sat with the tax collectors and the sinners because these were the sickest of people. These were the most unhealthy of people. You think you got it bad? That's who Jesus came for. That's who Christ's healing ministry is for. Christ's healing ministry is for us. Make it personal. Make it personal. There are some people who will get up and walk away. Verse 12 and 13 says, When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go learn what this means. I desire mercy and grace, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Oftentimes people will come, they'll hear the word. In John chapter 8, you find this woman, she's brought in sin, throw her at the feet of Jesus. They want him to kill her, to, sto to, to, to justify killing her. He bends down, stoops down, starts writing. That each one of, their, uh, of them are convicted. You know what they do? They get up. Each one of them, they walk away. Make it personal. Make it personal. It's not for the person who's not here. Make it personal for you. Make it personal. Number three. Jesus heals by restoring your communion with God. In verse 5 of Matthew 9, it says, For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. His purpose was to heal the man of his spiritual woundedness. The only reason he was healed physically so that people could understand that he was healed spiritually. That's the only reason. He said, I'm going to heal him now so that you can know that he's been forgiven. That he's been healed of his spiritual wounds. Okay? He came in order to restore our communion with God. He continue, continues in verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he says to him, follow me, so he rose and followed him. By following Christ, his, commun his, his relationship is restored with the Father. He has healing for his soul by becoming a disciple of Christ. Okay? Jesus heals by restoring our communion with God. Number four. God's presence in our relationship brings wholeness. Now, y'all, those of you who are married folks have probably heard in marriage there's three people, not two people. There's the husband, the wife, and Christ. I want to tell you very importantly that Christ's presence in our relationships brings wholeness. That goes for married people. That goes for us as a community. 
that goes for your group of friends, that goes for your circle of influence. When Jesus Christ himself is present in our relationships, we find wholeness in our relationships. Matthew chapter 9, we find this demon-possessed man in verse 32 and verse 33. It says, They went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. Man couldn't speak, couldn't communicate. Worst part of being in a, in a, in a uh, uh, community is not being able to commune. Okay? This man was in a community, but he couldn't commune. And if you married folks know, worst thing is when you're, in a, when you're married and you can never get a word in. Can't communicate. The other person's always talking. How was your day? It was good. Well, let me tell you about my day. <laughs> hold, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let me tell you about my day. You ask me about my day. In order for there to be relationship, there has to be communication. There has to be an exchange. Okay? God's presence in our relationships brings wholeness. And part of that means that there's an exchange between the two persons or the community with Christ in the, in the midst. The demon-possessed man, he couldn't communicate. As soon as the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. He became part of the community. He became whole. And that's why it says, the multitudes marveled and said it was never seen like this in Israel. He restores communion with you. He brings wholeness. Fifth and finally, God can use our unique life's circumstances to offer you. I said that God can. I didn't say that He will. The reason I said that He can is because you still have something called free will. So the healer is present, and He can use your life circumstances to offer healing to you, but it's never imposed upon us. We believe that you have free will. So you have an opportunity to respond to God in your unique life circumstances. Now, in Romans 8, 28, it says, We know that all things work together for good and doesn't stop there. A lot of people say, Oh, all things work together for good. God's going to use this and this and this and this to fix me up. Hold up. To those who love God and are called according to His purpose, which means He can use those, circumstances. Doesn't mean he throws dead people in your way. But when there's someone sick or unhealthy, sometimes it becomes a witness for us. I got to tell you one of the things that has really been a source of transformation in my own life, my own ministry has been death. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach a man to number his days that he may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, I don't believe God is sitting up there and saying, let's take this guy, Knock him off so that my son down there, serving in Princeton, can wake up a little bit. Let's shake him up a little bit. But when, importantly, God can use those circumstances to heal me if I respond to them. If I search for God, and I'm finding God, I'm looking for God, then that means even in the midst of the worst types of things, circumstances around me, or the best types of circumstances around me, I can find God in those places and God can offer me healing in the midst of those circumstances. God will use oftentimes what we want to teach us what we need, which is exactly what happened with the paralytic man. He can use those circumstances, things that we want, in order to teach us what we need and to offer us healing. The source of healing is Christ. There's no other place to find healing and wholeness apart from the working grace of Christ. Okay? It's the grace of God that's going to heal us. You're not going to find it anywhere else. And we're going to talk about next week, what does it look like to receive that healing? What does that mean? Okay? Because I believe a lot of times you say, okay, we know Christ heals. Now let me figure out what I can do, and I'm going to bring healing on myself doesn't really work like that, okay? 
So next week we're going to talk about what we need, what we need to do in order to receive something that's being given to us. Okay? We know the source. We know the person. We know the who. Now I want to talk about the how. Okay? So that's what we'll be talking about next week.